Hello, Alex. The floor is yours. Hello, Tonya. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And then here we are continuing our series of interview, as you said, from uh, downtown Kiev. We're in a trade house union, which is quite a symbolic place where tragic events uh, happened in 2014 and it was revealed since. So it's as I said, quite symbolic that we have our interview uh, today here. Now, we are joined by Igor Bigun, historian at the, at the Center for Research on the Liberation Movement. We are going to debunk with him Kremlin's most common propaganda narratives about Ukraine's history. Hello, Igor. Thank you for being Hello. with us today. So, uh, first and because we, before we, we begin the whole uh, interview, I suggest we watch uh, one of our special reports about this uh, history myth that, that Russian propaganda uh, uh, creates here there. The monument to Grand Prince Vladimir the Great in Kiev dates back to 1853. He brought Christianity to the region. And this is the monument dedicated to the great ruler in Moscow. It was unveiled near Red Square in 2016. Russian President Vladimir Putin called the Kievan prince his compatriot and the founder of the Russian state. This new monument is a tribute to our distinguished ancestor, revered saint, statesman, warrior and spiritual founder of the Russian state. Putin has also called Yaroslav the Wise and his daughter Anne of Kiev Russians during a 2017 meeting with French President Emmanuel Macron. Enlightened French people know about Anne, the Queen of France. She was the younger daughter of our Grand Prince Yaroslav the Wise, wife of Henry I, and she played an important role in the development of France. In fact, in the times when Vladimir was baptizing Rus and Anne of Kiev was the Queen of France, Moscow looked like this. That territory was called Zalisia, or the land beyond the forest. There were Finno-Urgian tribes living on those lands. Later, those lands were colonized by Kievan Rus. Only in the 12th century were the first principalities created. The myth that Russia is a successor state of the Kievan Rus was not invented by Putin. This myth originated in the 15th century. At the latest, at the end of the 15th century, when the Russian idea of the unification of all the former Kievan Rus under the authority of the Moscow Tsar emerged, the Moscovite elites then proclaimed the concept that Russia maintains until this day that the statehood of Kievan Rus was inherited by Moscow, as of the dynasty of Kiev princes continued there. But it wasn't so. The myth of the single nation was created in the 17th century and it was used as an excuse for imperial expansion. Moscovites stopped being descendants of the mixture of Finnic, Turkic and Slavic peoples and announced themselves the Great Russians, one of the offshoots of the ancient Rus people. Ukrainians were hence named Small Russians. Soviet historians morphed this myth into the idea of three brotherly nations, Ukrainians, Russians and Belarusians. In reality, and this is supported by archaeological finds, linguistic data and written data, it was established that Ukrainians as a nation developed from Slavic roots and when Ukrainian already existed, Russian did not. It started forming when the Ukrainian state already existed in the 12th century. For centuries, Russia claimed that Ukraine is a nation with no historical roots that supposedly Ukraine never had statehood and needs external control. Yet Kievan Rus is Ukraine. It was one of the biggest states in the Middle Ages. The early modern Hetmanate existed as a state for more than 100 years. It had diplomatic recognition in the world. Ukrainian Hetmans were treated as equals by kings and khans. Ukraine regained its independence in 1991, and it's no quirk in history or a random event, as Russia claims. It was a natural result of the nation's struggle for independence and sovereignty. Reported by Yulia Kuchkova, UATV. Now, uh, before we debunk in details all this, uh, all this myth, how do you explain Ukraine's special place in uh, the Russian narrative when it comes to reappropriation of history? Uh, well, I think that uh, uh, the Russian, Russian vision of this, uh, its own history 
uh, cannot be without Ukraine because uh, the the lion's share of its of its might of its uh, glorious history is connected to Ukraine, to Ukraine's territory, and to conquering Ukraine. Um, now the myth that that Russia uh, is a is a successor or or a heir of of the Kievan Rus um, was 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 not invented by by Putin. Who and the myth actually originated in the 15th century? Who who created the myth? Where 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 this myth does come from? Uh, well, uh, uh, as you correctly said, in the 15th century, uh, the Rush the Moscow Moscow Tsar mm-hmm. Ivan the uh, Third wanted to. Uh, to gain uh, well independence from the golden horde and he wanted to uh, somehow legitimize his uh, western uh, uh, conquerors of the uh, Rezan, of the mm-hmm. smolensk and other other uh, former rus cities and uh, he proclaimed himself as the uh, sovereign of all rus gosudar vsey rusi so uh, this was like mm, an attempt uh, to show that uh, uh, he uh, to to oppose himself to oppose his state uh, to the Tatar and Mo- Mo- Mongol rule and to uh, bring some bounds to Rus and to Byzantine Empire. Empire. So there was a way for him to to to, to exist. You mean on a, on a, on a, on a uh, level of, let's say, his international level at the time. Of course, that is. Um, now, we we saw the we saw the, the images of uh, of Putin and, and uh, Mr. Macron uh, calling Yaroslav the Wise and his daughter Anna of Kiev uh, Russian, which is uh, quite far 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 fetched. Uh, can you can you expand on on this? Uh, I wouldn't say appropriation, but manipulation itself of history. Well, this is this is the continuation of uh, this uh, uh, myth of uh, Russia and uh, Rus. So, uh, in fact, uh, the the Russians, uh, Russian historians, may say that uh, they have some connection to the Yaroslav the Wise because uh, before uh, mm, coming to, to to power in Kiev, uh, he used to be the prince of uh, Rostov and prince of Novgorod. These are modern. Russian cities, but uh, in fact, uh, their, their territory of these principalities in Middle Ages uh, was of very low share as uh, compared to the whole territory of modern Russia. And uh, uh, well, uh, Yaroslav the Wise became famous for his achievements uh, when he become the ruler of Kiev, of mm-hmm. Kiev principality and uh, the ruler of all uh, Ru- uh, Ruthenian principalities. So uh, it is not uh, quite uh, correct to associate him with uh, Russia, on, only with Russia. And besides, uh, in the media, Middle Ages, uh, uh, there were no um, connotation, no... Um, as, uh, we didn't, there were no Russians, separate Russians or Ukrainians or mm-hmm. other other nations in modern in modern meaning. There were no such nations. There were uh, different Slavonic uh, tribes, and uh, of course uh, there could not be direct connection between uh, Yaroslav the Wise and uh, modern Russian rulers. <laughs> so you're saying that is basically applying the, con- the, the concept, even the, the, the concept of nation that we, as we understand it today, in a context that where, where it's basically doesn't make sense to apply it. That is. Um, now let's focus a little bit of, um, on, on, on Anna of Kiev because what is interesting with her is she she's also a, at the origin of one of the first dynasty of, of kings in, uh, in France. Is that a way by manipulating the history saying, let's say, um, that Anna of Kiev is Russian, is that a way to, to, to strengthen links between France and, and, and Russia? Is it a way to twist those links? How do you, how do you perceive that? Well, the the argumentation is the same uh, uh, as far as the Yaroslav of, Yaroslav the Wise uh, was not the the, the na- uh, native Russian, as, as mm-hmm. it is said. So his daughter uh, was neither, 
and uh, uh, she uh, represented the Kiev and Rus, the Slavonic uh, in the Middle Ages state with its capital in Kiev, not mm -hmm. in Moscow, not in other uh, Russian city. So uh, this was a like diplomatic uh, marriage, as it was uh, mm -hmm. tradition in uh, within. Uh, between monarchs. So uh, this diplomatic marriage uh, just strengthened uh, bounds uh, of uh, Kiev Rus with other European uh, states, European empires and European dynasties. Um, except Yaroslav the Wise and his daughter Anna of Kiev, are there other Ukraine's um, historical figure that have been reappropriated by, by Russia? Can you quote some? Oh, they are legion uh, from different uh, ages, different centuries. We can say that uh, uh, Russian propaganda, Russian historians uh, call uh, Ukrainian, uh, uh, he was imperial Russian artist of Ukrainian mm -hmm. origin, Ilya Repin, mm -hmm. uh, famous for his uh, paintings of uh, Ukrainian lifestyle, Ukrainian ethnography and history about Cossacks and Haidamakas. Uh, for example, uh, famous well-known American aircraft designer of Ukrainian origin, Igor Sikorsky. Mm -hmm. He was born in uh, Kiev. His uh, mother was uh, Ukrainian, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so, uh, but in Russian books, in Russian media, it is said that he was Russian. Mm -hmm. He was Russian, Russian constructor. Uh, there are other numerous, um, numerous examples. For example, for example, Sergei Korolev, uh, also Soviet and uh, worldwide uh, known um, designer of uh, space rockets, space uh, aircraft. Uh, so he, uh, he, he was the creator of the uh, Soviet uh, space program and uh, launched the first uh, satellite, the first uh, uh, person into space, Yuri Hagarin. And uh, if we read Russian books, they, mm -hmm. they, uh, they try to, to, to hide that he was, he was Ukrainian. They, they uh, say that he is theirs. Uh, he, he, he is Soviet, and Soviet um, is equivalent to mm -hmm. Russian in modern Russian discourse. So that means that if, um, in, in, in this Russian mentality, that means that if a Ukrainian has great achievements, he must be Russian. That, that, that's, that's, there. That, that's the idea here, that's the logic here. That is the, mm -hmm. the idea, and if uh, he or she was born in, uh, on the territory that once may have uh, been under Russian rule, so this person automatically becomes Russian. Did you observe uh, yourself as a historian, did you observe a surge of this reappropriation, cultural and historical reappropriation after, 2000, uh, after 2014? Was, it, was there a link between and, and, and this uh, manipulation with, with, uh, of history? Or is, is it, was it a continuing phenomenon uh, that, already, that was already there before? Uh, this phenomenon uh, uh, was not invented in 2014. It, mm -hmm. it uh, has roots uh, deep in the uh, imperial uh, uh, historiography in the Soviet, and uh, 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 <clears throat> and it uh, uh, gains uh, some boost uh, on the other, on the each stage of the, so our history, history mm -hmm. of Russia, or history of Ukraine. For example, when Ukraine uh, became independent, when uh, uh, Ukraine uh, has its uh, first uh, protest uh, in Maidan in 2004, or in uh, second Maidan in 2000. Uh, 13 and 14, mm -hmm. uh, each of these uh, events uh, makes the Russian propagandists uh, to, to invade the more and uh, uh, more wild and uh, insane allegations uh, towards Ukrainian, Ukrainians and its history, its, uh, its uh, territory, mm -hmm. for example. Now, we are, we'll come back to this uh, cultural and uh, historical war in a moment, but 
Uh, how much does Vladimir Putin need? Because you, you, you said an interesting word, uh, imperial, and there is definitely this idea of, of the czar kind of idea in his, in his, uh, in his vision of, of, of himself, of a, a new, new Russia. Mm -hmm. uh, how much does Vladimir Putin, as let's say a new czar, needs uh, the history of Ukraine to, to, to build himself this, this empire? Well, uh, his image of this uh, tight ruler and uh, new emperor uh, can't exist without, without uh, his um, well, vict victories and history of victories uh, of Russia in, in, in Ukraine. Because mm -hmm. uh, Rus Russians uh, consider like, Ukraine a battlefield of, uh, of their Russian uh, um, power and West, Western power. They even, I heard that uh, Russian uh, speakers call the uh, war with Ukraine in Donbass as not war with Ukraine, but the war with, with America, with the mm. well, with They the see European the bigger, they see like a bigger adversary, adversary behind it. Uh, mm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. So it's, uh, it seems like uh, they uh, view uh, mm, this modern, modern contemporary as the uh, like uh, uh, repeat of the history of the uh, Cold War. Mm -hmm. Now, um, also in the, in the, in the, in the sujet that we, we watch, there is this idea that uh, of, of brotherhood, of so-called brother, three brotherly nations uh, between Ukrainians, Russian, and, and Belarusian. Can you, uh, can you expand on this, on this myth when it was created and for, for, for which purpose exactly? Well, uh, uh, as uh, other myths, this one also originates from uh, the Russian imperial times. Well, uh, when the uh, Russian uh, Empire uh, seized the uh, uh, lands of right bank Ukraine, mm -hmm. of uh, Western uh, Belarus, of uh, some uh, Polish lands, uh, they needed to create some um, well, basis, uh, some basis. So why sh did they need it? Why these lands belong to the Saint Petersburg? So uh, they started to say that uh, well, um, Ukrainians and Belarusians and they are uh, they are not separate nations. They are the part of uh, uh, Russians, Ruskich, uh, mm -hmm. but uh, just other branches. So, well, Ukrainians are little, smaller Russians, Malarosi, and uh, uh, Belarusians are like white, white mm -hmm. Russians. So, uh, as far as uh, they are some kind of Russians, so that uh, the Russian empire had uh, all rights to conquer these lands, and these lands are uh, like... Uh, Incorporated into into the whole uh, empire, and of course this myth is uh, very uh, has very long life because uh, when uh, when Russian when uh, the Russian uh, government uh, conducts its mm -hmm. Policy in the Eastern Europe, of course. Uh, it's, it's the same. It's the same kind of uh, kind, kind, kind of, uh, yes, kind of yes, idea of, behind yes, it. it. And also, this idea of conquering by history, by by culture, also leads and also led um, throughout history, and and we saw it is also recently to a certain erasement of of, of culture, um, like Ukrainian being not spoken and being forbidden to to to, to be to be spoken. Uh, what's 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 your take? What's your take on that? Because at one point Ukrainians, ident it does create in in reverse a Ukrainians' identity. Because at one point Ukrainians go goes out. How to, how can Russia really erase that kind of completely different culture? And how does that, how how do they manage that? They uh, need to manage, of mm. course. Uh, they didn't manage to erase our mm -hmm. culture at all completely, but. Uh, they uh, achieved uh, some some successes, mm -hmm. and uh, we have to deal with uh, these consequences uh, even after uh, 28 years of Ukraine's independence. Uh, 
Uh, well, uh, um, for example, uh, until 19th, until the early 20th century, uh, not uh, the national identity was on the top, but the religious one. And so mm -hmm. uh, the Russian emperors uh, 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 disseminated the, mm -hmm. this, the Russian idea, the idea of Russian world to the uh, Russian Orthodox, uh, Orthodox Church. They had the formula... Uh, well, uh, autocracy, uh, orthodoxy, and and uh, well, nation nationhood. So, mm. uh, uh, if if a person if a person identified uh, him or herself as an orthodox Christian, so uh, then he's in, Russian. Yes, okay. so in, in the Russian Empire, yeah. this uh, was equivalent as he or she was uh, Russian. And uh, the other point was that. Um, uh, the Russian culture, the Russian language was uh, given uh, priority always because uh, well, administration was Russian speaking, uh, the army was Russian speaking, the, uh, the language of uh, merchants, the language of business was also Russian. So the, the, the Russian language and culture uh, became uh, associated with the like progress, was, uh, the, the language of cities, and cities were progress like uh, in the age of uh, uh, capitalistic mm -hmm. develop, development. This also continued in the Soviet Union because uh, the communist doctrine uh, praised uh, workers, praised proletariat, so they praised uh, cities and the countryside, the collective farmers were not uh, so uh, pre as prestigious class mm. as uh, the workers were. So, um, if a person, um, this was like, um, uh, like uh, not war, but the conflict between the cities and between the peasants. Mm -hmm. So, uh, if a person wanted to be associated with, uh, well, to be modern person, a person progressive, progress, yes, progressive, indeed. of course, very with mm. high, mm. high educated and uh, with high culture. So he, he or she tried uh, to um, assimilate uh, with, with themselves with, with, uh, with dominating mm. culture, and dominating culture was uh, Russian. Which brings me to to, uh, to modern day Ukraine. Do you think you talked about uh, cult and Russian Orthodox Church? Uh, of course, last year the Thomas was was uh, was adopted to create yes. a Ukrainian uh, Church autocephaly. Uh, language law was adopted to for for Ukrainian to, to for Ukrainian to, to be taught uh, to be spoken. Sorry, in uh, in the services in administration. Uh, do you think it's going in the, in the, in the right way? Do you think it's a, it's the right way to do it to, to to, uh, let's say, continue and preserve Ukrainian identity by doing so and by reusing, you know, this cult and language and, as you said, uh, this mechanism, this reverse mechanism. What's your, what's your stance on that? Uh, I agree with that because uh, um, I believe that uh, nobody, no other entity, no other state uh, would uh, preserve Ukrainian identity than the Ukrainian state itself. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, I think that uh, uh, Ukrainian uh, uh, Ukrainian government, Ukrainian administration uh, have all needed tools, needed instruments to to support and to uh, promote Ukrainian language and Ukrainian culture. Uh, and uh, um, of course. Uh, the religi religious uh, matter is uh, also of great uh, importance because, as I've said, that uh, the Russian state uses uh, the Russian Orthodox uh, Church as some transnational, uh, transnational way to uh, disperse uh, the, these ideas of the so-called Russian world. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, uh, in fact... Uh, Mm, I studied uh, many uh, cases when well, mm, people who attend uh, different churches have different political views, have different uh, um, values and different identity. For example, a person, uh, people who are... Um, uh, 
uh, who believe or who 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 go to who belongs to a certain, belong, to, 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 uh, a certain yeah. to belong to a uh, Russian Orthodox mm -hmm. community uh, um, support pro-Russian parties pro-Russian views more mm -hmm. and uh, with uh, Ukrainian uh, church believers the situation is vice versa. Now, um, <clears throat> what we, we talked about is some sort of pattern from Russia. Uh, we talked about the repropriation of historical figures. We talked about repropriation of history, erasing a certain culture. What can uh, history in general, in that matter, uh, teach us to, as of today? And what, how, how can it help Ukraine to actually fight uh, uh, Russian propaganda, Russian, Russian myth, not for not to allow it again, not to allow that kind of, of mechanism of reappropriation again. Uh, well, the uh, thorough study of history may uh, serve as uh, as uh, instruction of how uh, one should do and how one shouldn't. Mm -hmm. So, uh, first, first of all, uh, our politicians may uh, look at the politicians of the past and see their all uh, achievements and their uh, fails, and not to uh, not to repeat that fails and to enrich these uh, achievements. Uh, we uh, see that many situations, many episodes from the past are also repeated in the, our modern modern times and um, well we should uh, know from the history of uh, Ukrainian people's republic that which uh, the, the, the that uh, Ukrainian state also waged war mm -hmm. Uh, either uh, as with uh, the Bolshevist Russia, as with white uh, mm. white Russia, and uh, all uh, all proposals for peace, all for proposals for negotiations were uh, neglected by mm. both of uh, the Russian uh, powers. So now mm. our leaders uh, have to know that uh, well. Mm, uh, Russia cannot be uh, prevailed by uh, negotiations or by uh, well, capitulations or by some peace uh, uh, proposals because uh, when Russia wants to wage war, it does. So our uh, our well, our aim here and now mm -hmm. must be to be strong, to become strong and to, to uh, defend ourselves. Uh, other lesson from our history is that, uh, uh, of course, we have to seek for allies. And mm -hmm. uh, uh, I think that uh, the most uh, reliable allies should be in the West and our Western neighbors. But, uh, of course, uh, uh, on the other mm -hmm. hand, uh, our government uh, also needs to know that uh, um, it, uh, it, needs, it doesn't need to forget mm -hmm. that uh, nobody will rescue us uh, exactly. without, without, without our efforts. Except Ukraine itself. Thank you very much for this uh, reminder. It was a pleasure to have you uh, today in our uh, outdoor special uh, outdoor studio. You're welcome. Uh, that was uh, Igor Bigun, historian at the Center for Research on the Liberation Movement. We continue our multi-language marathon. Throughout the day, we will tell you about uh, Ukraine's independence, the price the country paid it, paid for it, and the, the heroes who defended it. Thank you for watching UATV and stay tuned for the rest. <laughs>